kind of asked you already to talk about that in Helsinki Nida, and then I'm going to talk about here. So we might have to talk about what you're going to talk about in Helsinki, you know? So I'm going to send you some Slack messages <laughs> next to me. But anyways. Does this happen every time? This is the second work camp that I attend, and it's the second time I see Otto giving a yard. I think, it, I think it's a battle. And also, Daniel had exactly the same time slot that he had in work at Helsinki like last year, so I think there is something weird going on here, you know? <laughs> and it's always the same people. <laughs> So, learn how to make database dumps. 
format. It's designed to be interoperable so that you can take it from different database versions, export it and import it to other places. You can't do that to the binary, binary form database. So learn how to do it. The classical command is minus to a dump. And if, you're, if you have a PP CLI, you can also run PPDB export. And I hope you can see that, but here's my one-liner how I run BPDB export. So this guarantees that the state of your data is consistent, that it's a, if, the, if it takes a long time for the database to, to be generated and there's new updates coming in, with this command you're doing it in a single transaction, so it's consistent that there's no inconsistencies inside the database. And this also produces a text dump where every row in your database is a row in the file. So it's easy to read and edit. And what you can do with this, you can do it whatever you can do with text files. You can, for example, take a database dump, then do some changes in, let's say, some plugin options, then make a new dump, and then do a diff between those dumps to see what actually was changed in the database by the plugin. And here you can see some SQL language telling that in this example it's inserting into this interns table these values. And if you're interested to learn what the standard WordPress database consists of, this page will explain all the tables and the columns what they are for. Tip number two, learn DP CLI database commands. There's actually many useful ones. So I will tell you about import export. You can list the size of your database tables to quickly figure out if your database is loaded or not. You can enter the MySQL or MariaDB console with DP DB CLI. You can do searches in the database. And the last one is my favorite, which I use all the time. If you can do a search through things in the database, for example, when you are moving a site from a development environment to production or changing the address in production or something like that, you can just run this. In this example, I'm changing the other URLs to have HTTPS instead of HTTP. Tip number three. Use Adminer to browse the database. How many of you are using PHP MyAdmin? Only a few ones. How many of you are using Adminer? The majority. Cool. I think that's that's way better. So if you haven't heard about Adminer before, check it out. Alright, then tip number four. So did you know that in every single WordPress page load? This specific database file is always wrong. Did you know that? Yeah. One, one knew about it. So this is the table where WordPress stores options. And if the column autoload has the value yes, then this is something that PHP will read on every WordPress page load. And sometimes this table gets bloated. And with this command, you can check how many rows it returns, how much data, and also when you're running any SQL manually from the console or through a tool like Adminer, it will show you how long it took to create, to respond to this query. In this example, five milliseconds, which is good, or actually, yeah, five. And if this takes too long or returns too much data, then every single WordPress page store on your site will be slow. And in the WordPress documentation, it said that this table is not supposed to be over one megabyte ever. Because all of that is loaded into every single PHP process for WordPress. And with this handy SQL tip, 
if your data, if your, if this query or if this table is bigger than one megabyte, with this query you can find what are the biggest options in the database. And sometimes, unfortunately, there are stupid plugins that pollute the options database where the plugin developer is completely unaware of this. Thing. And if you are a database, you should first try to clean up that your options database is not too big. And if you can't, in any way, if it's completely impossible, then you should add a, an index to make that database work faster. So if your database is very small, then you shouldn't have an index because then the index will be an overhead, but if your database is big, then you should have an index because then it will, the end result will be faster. Another table that quite often it's way too big on production sites is DB Postman. How many of you have run into this situation that you know is the DB Postman that big? Yes. So this is typical, for example, for WooCommerce or any other system or plugin that uses a lot of post-meta data. So the problem with post-meta is that if you have a post and the post has many fields like title and line and contents and so on, they are just one column in the database and all of your posts is on one row. The structure of the post meta table is different. You have a, a key and a value. It's basically a key value store, and then you have the contents of that. So, so every single field will create a new line in the database and cross it. And with this SQL command, you can you can check out what are the most common key names in your DP post and the database to find out what's below it. And by the way, jumping to the beginning, there is my Twitter handle. So I'm gonna post the slides on there and you can then copy paste all the SQL commands. So just follow me on Twitter and you will get these slides. So let me explain this inquiry a little bit. So it's a select, so it fetches data, and then it has this substring function. It takes the value in the meta tree column, and then it takes the characters 1 to 20, and then names that key start, and then it counts how many rows with that key start exist, and then returns a list grouped by the key start and ordered by the count. So basically here's an example of what you get. So the point here is that in the DB post the table there's lots of values that have the same beginning but are not exactly the same. So now when I'm taking just the 21st, 21st characters then I know kind of what category or what plugin or what type of key is this for. Did anybody understand this question? I see no difference. <coughs> so the reason why I like why I wanted to give this talk is that there are way few, way too few developers who care about the database or understand the basics. And quite often you, have, you notice that there's plugins that are stupid, are stupid code that they just keep filling in the database and eventually the site will run to a full stop because if you fill it in the database, it will be a stroke and never purge anything or ever think about that, then you will run into problems. So I want to raise awareness about database. Best practices in this are quite simple. Just look at the database, how big it is, and what are the values in the database. It's not, not complex. But then I also 
recommend that you learn SQL. You don't have to learn a lot, but the basic commands like select, update, delete, so that if you read code and you see these commands, then you have some clue what they might mean, and you know how to Google for for the for the more detailed functions. And also, you should understand that database systems are very basic in computer science. All applications basically in the database, and the database systems we are running today are already quite mature. For example, Maria Levy, the development of MySQL started at the beginning of the 90s, I think 96, so it's now plus for 22 years old. So there's a huge amount of engineering and algorithms and performance that built into the database database code. So you should try to leverage on that and not just load everything from the database into PHP and then roll your own algorithms in PHP. That's the best Let the database do the work and prepare the data for you and then you have less work to do than PHP. And also, if you notice that your application or your plugin is floating with the post meta, then don't be afraid to make your own tables with the sensible data structure. And also you should learn SQL, but you should also learn what an index means and what a full table scan means. Because you want to avoid full table scans. That means that the database can't use any shortcuts to find the information you requested, but it needs to read all of the database. So if you have one gigabyte database, then all of that is read into the CPU and processed to find the information you want. So you want to avoid those and use have good indexes instead or other shortcuts. So first I said learn SQL. But next I say don't use it directly. Most of the time you should use the functions that are built in into WordPress. So I'm quite sure how many of you have used the get posts function? And the rest of in the room are not developers. I see. So use that for the basics. And if that not that doesn't do what you want, then you can go one step up in the chain and use the PP query class. And here's an example, you can do quite complex queries with the DP query class, giving it a, as an array the parameters what you want to fetch from the database. And if that's not enough for you, then you can use the DBDB instance and the functions get row and insert and so on. And if you're not doing these standard queries and you really want to write your own custom SQL, then the proper way to do that is to first run this VPDB prepare command and then give that the query parameters that are interactive from the user or from other part of the database and then send that to the VPDB query. This helps you to avoid SQL injections. So I'm not going to go into the details of this. I'm just mentioning that all of these functions exist. Do use get posts for your simple cases and then go up the kind of food chain. And if none of the other ready-made functions work for you, only then go to the raw DPDP prepare inquiry functions. So that's the correct way to call the database. Then the second thing you need to make sure is that the database server itself is correctly installed and configured and running well. So because I've been involved in the development of MariaDB, I recommend that. And I heard that lots of people don't like Oracle and their other stewardship of MySQL that much. So most people recommend MariaDB and use a recent version, at least 10.1, but the latest version is already 10.3. So use, don't, don't use any 5.5 versions of anything that's really, really old and today. 
Then inside the database, you can choose what storage engine you are using. So the best one is InnoDB. And then there's hundreds of configuration options you can choose. And one of the most important ones is the character set. You need to have UTF MD4. So not UTF8, but this UTF MD4, so that you get support for emojis. And then you need to set your collation correctly. So collation means that if you fetch, for example, the list of users from the database, sorted by the last name, then the database will do that for you. And the sorting depends on what's your collation setting. So if you have Finnish or Swedish collation, then for example, OAE will be at the end of the list. But if you have an American collation, then O, A, and A will all be in the beginning of the list. Because in the American collation, they are not considered characters at the end of the alphabet. And then there's a huge amount of other settings regarding performance and reliability of data that you go through. And if you don't want to do that, if you have a really big team and application, you should probably hire a database expert or you should use a WordPress upkeep company or hosting company that provides the database pre-configured for you. So that was eight tips about the database. And my ninth tips, ninth tip is that you don't need to use the database all the time necessarily. And Timmy already had a presentation on transients. So here's a very simple Code example, slightly more simple than what Timmy showed. Maybe it's easier to grasp this one. So you have an if in the beginning, and you fetch your data from the transient. And if the data was cached, then your variable will contain the data. And if it wasn't cached, then the variable will be empty, and this if will evaluate to false and then it will run the actual wire into the database and store the transient and then continue with the value. How many of you are using transients already in your code? How many of you will start using transients next week?
learn the details yourself. Right. The tip number 10 is that if you want to know what's happening in the database right now, there's a command for that. It. It's show processes. How many of you have used show processes? Two, two, three people. All right. So you should go and check this someday. If you have VPC CLI on your website, most of you hopefully have. So you just go there with SSH to your site, then write VPDB CLI, then you have your console open, and then you write show processes, colon, semicolon, and enter, and it will show you the, the queries that are currently running and how long it took. And you can run this command many times over to get, get a feel what are the most what's happening in your day. Okay, so this is very easy. This is real time. And then in MySQL and RDB there is a feature called slow login, which you can put on in the configuration. And what it does is that you can define a threshold, for example 10 seconds, and when you have slow login on, then RDB will log all the wires that took more than 10 seconds in the log file, and then you can go later and read that log file and investigate what are the slow ones and then assume those are some kind of bottlenecks and then try to optimize them. And also, if you are using a profiling system, for example, our, we have an integration with Tideways, so you can run it in, in production and get insight into what your PhD is doing, it will hook into the in, into one percent of your traffic so that your site doesn't get slowed down, and then analyze that one percent of the PSP executions, and it will also the main focus for Tideways is analyzing PHP, but it will also show you information about your SQL queries and what your database is doing. Right. And then one extra tip here in the beginning, in the, in the middle. So please don't push your development database into production. We've had cases where WordPress site credentials in production you can log in with Vagrant username and Vagrant password and so So try to figure out a workflow that doesn't involve pushing your development database into production. I know this is a bit hard because WordPress isn't designed from the beginning to be developer friendly in this sense that you can't just do a git push of your code and everything will need to be there because there's lots of plugins and teams that have settings that are stored in the database, and then you have the uploads and so on. So you have data in different places, and you might be tempted to get everything correctly in your development environment and just, and just push an identical copy into production. But don't push, whatever you do, just don't push all of your development database into production. That's a risk factor. And then, two extra ones. So, you probably know that in WordPress, when you're writing a post, it will do these autosaves. So you get these revisions, and you can have tens of previous revisions of a blog post. That's good for history, you can go back. But if you have this for all eternity, it might fill up your database. So here is the handy SQL query to delete all of your post revisions that are older than 2018. You probably don't need your post revisions from last year anymore. Then there's a second SQL command to delete all of your transients from the database. So transients is good, and then especially good if you're using race. Sometimes if you have lots of transients and they're all going to the B options database, then that might shoot yourself in the leg because then the VP objects they will get slow. So with this command you can delete everything from the all the transients from the database and that's safe because those the the, the, the transients that actually are still used will automatically regenerate next time PHP runs. Yes. Uh, I have a question. If you don't define the expiration type of transients when you save it. All the branches that you save, that, 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 that 
not define an expiration time will be stored in the database forever and they will be defined as an auto logical option. So that's, that's a, I can see that could cause lots of problems. And then also people who are reading this tip number 11 are probably in the process of trying to clean up their database from old craft. And one way, so WordPress plugins have this uninstall.php shipped with them is if they are correctly written and that uninstall.php is supposed to trigger when you uninstall it. not when you deactivate but when you uninstall it or permanently and it's supposed to be clean up and take the database whatever that plugin created in the database and clean that up and take it away but sometimes that doesn't work or maybe you had the plugin at some time and it didn't at that time yet have this uninstalled PHP. So what you can do that if you see that you have, for example, uh, let's say you have Yoast installed and you want to get rid of it and all of the stuff Yoast has in the database, and you already uninstalled Yoast, but you notice that you still have in the database Yoast stuff. So you can go to the Yoast source code and check out what's inside the uninstalled PHP and then just copy paste the SQL commands or something like that to clean up your database with those. And then tip number 12. How many of you knew that you can append the word explain to any SQL command and you will get an explanation what's it do, what does it do? Good. So once you've learned a little bit of SQL and you know what the index is and the full table scan is, then you can start using this. This is a very simple example, but if you have a longer select with maybe joins and so on, then this explain will have multiple rows and it will give you all kinds of tips or explanations what the optimizer is doing when it's trying to get you the result of this query. So then you can see if, if indexes are used and what keys in those indexes are used and so on. <coughs> then you can read up in the readable really documentation what this means and that should scare you how to optimize your database. If you have a small site, then the customer is probably small and doesn't have money to pay for optimization and since the site is small it doesn't really matter. But once you go into enterprise grade WordPress sites, then you will have a, a big database and database performance and things like this will start to happen. Alright, that was it. Thanks. Thing with options not being invalidated correctly is a bug in 
where it was core and we we located where it is and if you have our server plugin installed on your site it will mitigate that bug in the core and the various cache will work perfectly at least to our knowledge at the moment. <laughs>